What's going on guys, it's David here, and I just want to welcome you guys to episode two of the Create As Prescribed podcast. And today's guest, we have Jared Truby. Jared is a um, business owner, co-founder of Cat and Cloud. Cat and Cloud is probably one of my favorite coffee shops here in the Bay Area, one of them. Um, probably because uh, I used to be a barista. I used to work in coffee for a little bit of time. Um, and uh, when I was working in coffee, I heard about Cat and Cloud and I used to work also in Santa Cruz. So a lot of different ties there, but uh, he's also a pretty avid CrossFitter. Um, and so it's cool to see somebody who's crushing it in the business world, uh, particularly coffee that also has a passion for CrossFit. Today's episode is really dope because he just kind of talks a lot about uh, growing up, how he got into coffee, uh, the parallels between a business and a CrossFit and how uh, CrossFit actually can help to become a better business owner with a lot of the different lessons that you learn. So um, if you are interested in coffee, if you are interested in starting your own business, um, this is the podcast for you. Um, also, a little update, I started a Patreon, so if you would like to donate to creating uh, me creating this content um, got some little perks in there. I'm going to be adding some more tiers in there, but um, you will get early access to these episodes as they come out. So, if you would do so, if you would love, if you love this episode, if you love this series, uh, make sure to check that out as well as like, comment, and subscribe, guys. That's going to be it. Let's go ahead and hop into today's episode. Yeah. Really? They think the California accent is cool. And I'm like, not anywhere else in the world. <laughs> they all make fun of us. <laughs> so hard. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, tell me a little about yourself. Where I'm from? Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, so I'm Jared Truby. I grew up in Chico, California, a little small town, a little college town uh, north of Sacramento, like an hour and a half. Uh, and got into coffee. My dad was always into it on this little bit of a next level where he would find gosh, these weird, like, this coffee's from Kenya, and this coffee's from Guatemala in this time where coffee was really, really new. So he got me really into that. Uh, and, and through that process and, and living there in that little small town, I got the opportunity to help start a company called Verve Coffee here in Santa Cruz in 2007. And since then, I've progressed and just become more interested in cultural development and leadership and pushing myself until... Woo, baby! We dropped the camera! It's getting serious! <laughs> so sin serious. I think it's okay. I think it's okay. Anyway, that was a moment. That was real life. Uh, yeah, and then here we are, flash forward to uh, Cat and Cloud. We're two years in, and we are crushing it. We got a staff of 36 people, really focused on professional development, leadership development, and, and also just personal development. We believe that that is something that is missing in this world. And so that's a big part of our mission, which is literally to leave people happier than we found them. And that's like a quick one minute sum up if I was on a podcast and had to like fire the gun. <laughs> so with that, like growing up, uh, what was like, you know, with coffee and stuff like that, like were you pretty into sports and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Were you more into like arts? Like what was mm -hmm, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. that? Yeah, so okay, growing up, yeah, I played, I played basketball, I was on the basketball team, became the captain, that whole deal. I was always into sports, my parents were into triathlon, so I watched them compete in what I thought was the most crazy thing. My dad did an Ironman distance, for those of y'all who don't know, it's like a two mile swim, 126 miles of biking, and then a 26 mile run in the same day. He got really into stuff like that, and yeah, so I was into that. I did football. I did every sport I could possibly get my hands on. I had ADD growing up. And so in the traditional sense, everybody told me, which is a lie, that I was kind of incapable of normal schooling. And so in order for me to kind of express myself, yeah, I, I was into kind of the arts. So I, I, doing, I did some choir stuff and I did a little like artsy writing and things like that that never really were for anything other than cathartic experiences and, and expression. But I found myself mostly being a person who thrived with connecting everyone around me. So I was kind of the person who knew all the groups and was in all the groups, but didn't necessarily live in any place with the exception of sports. So I wasn't a jock, and I wasn't a choir geek, and I wasn't a um, like the artsy poetry side of the world. I was just kind of like this dude who got in with everybody. And I think that inspired me to think about 
holistic groups of people and bringing them together. And I became really inspired and I saw a lot of opportunity and I believe that with the right people you can do anything. And that was just in me from the beginning. So I got this cool juxtaposition of being super into sports and becoming a captain and seeing the fruits of people who all had different talents coming together to do something bigger than themselves there. And then I saw this ability to build communities by just being kind of accepting and open and again, seeing opportunities with people and where they thrive and bringing them together. And so that's always kind of been under everything I've done. Uh, I was super into music. I did band stuff. I did, you know, lead singer cover bands only because I was too afraid to write my own music. But there was this big push from when I was young to just kind of achieve things and push myself and be more. One way with sports, other ways with music, and ultimately, yeah, bringing people together was was always kind of the the catalyst underneath it all. What made it all worth something and meaningful. Um, so, kind of bringing uh, with, uh, with going, I guess, that same sort of like, uh, vibe, or not vibe, but yeah. the path of uh, when you're younger. Yeah. With going to school, um, was that as far as like going to secondary school, college, right. like that? How was good question right on yeah so yeah go to college right you're supposed to go to high school so that you can select a college so that you can go on to become X I was seriously struggling with that I I went to a little private school I was the poor kid so every day at my private school for me to be able to go there I had to go clean bathrooms after school I think I was one of two people in the whole school who had to do that because everybody else was rich and fully taken care of. A lot of internal turmoil because we were, we were super poor, super poor, like my dad, bankruptcy, the whole nine. And everybody in my school got to do what they wanted, when they wanted, how they wanted because mom and dad would take care of it. And that, not a knock, that's just the luck of their draw. So everybody got to go on to these private colleges and I felt left out because I didn't feel like that was the path for me for a couple of reasons. One, I didn't know why I was going to college. I didn't have the future set out. I grew up with all these people who were like, well, my dad's a doctor. I'm going to be a doctor. My mom's a nurse. I'm going to be a nurse. My whatever, lawyer, all these professions that are like the status quo professions that somehow equal status. One, I didn't buy into that. Two, I didn't have the money to go to these colleges. So. I actually did earn scholarships for sports and leadership. I happened to be on um, whatever, the ASB. And I got to go to some of these colleges and nobody told me that aside from your scholarship, like taking a loan means you actually, like you're 18, you're writing down like, I'm going to pay you back this money. And I did grown up with all these rich people who were like, yeah, just sign it, it's fine. And so yeah, I started in secondary school. I went to uh, two different private colleges that are really well known, one for engineering and medicine and the other one for totally something else because it's been a long time and I don't care. I didn't stay. Long story short, I got there. I realized that nobody cares about you and, except for your friends who went there. I realized that the counselors at the school are just doing their job and they didn't even listen to me. I was like, here's what I know and what I want to do. And they started placing me in these classes that I had no idea how to participate in or even be any good at. And I ended up just sitting there being like, I'm wasting my time and my money and my life. And so I ended up leaving the one private college in Washington where I was playing basketball. And then I left uh, another private college in the Napa Valley and went back home to Chico. And man, it was it was kind of a struggle after that, you know, kind of a little bit of lost lost in the in the ranks. I, I went back to just like playing basketball because I loved it. Got really into the city league and and everybody was like, man, if you would have not gone to private college, you actually could have played college ball and just like made me feel like shit. Because I'm like, cool, my whole path has been just like wasted. I, I could have I could have been, you know, they're like, man, you could have for sure been in like a D1 in in uh, NCAA school. And I'm like, if you only got coaching, if you only, if you only. And I'm like, well, that's the path. So awesome where am I at now and and so yeah there was some really 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 hard times in Chico I, I did fall into coffee there and because of that here I am like I said in the sum up at the beginning but that was more of just having a job Chico's one of those places it's Neverland you could earn $15 an hour and own a house 
And so nobody left. Everybody stayed the same. And I just, I knew that wasn't right for me. And so that was kind of the, the path. And as soon as the opportunity to transition from coffee and Chico to starting a bigger company and pursuing at the time what I thought would be greatness, it was weird. I knew, I knew that was like a moment in my life where I was just like, it's a career change time. It's a life change time, really. I'm leaving my hometown for the first time for real and committing to a new town. So it was gnarly when we came to Santa Cruz. And yeah, I had no friends for a year. We founded Verve Coffee over on 41st Avenue down the street. And it was, and it became wildly successful 10 years later. And when you moved back uh, to Chico from, uh, from college, yeah. what, like, what was that time like? I mean, mm -hmm. how long were you working at the uh, coffee shop? Yeah. Like, was there like a specific instance to where I was just like, okay, like, this is like, I need to get out of here. Like, this is like, I need to do something else besides the business. Yeah, dude, this is great. So, so when I moved back to Chico, yeah, I got a coffee job and we decided to participate in some barista competitions. First one I did, I got last place. And I was like, okay, great, I have a lot to learn. So I was encouraged, I was like, okay, I have something to learn, I have an avenue, an outlet. And so I started there, but being back in Chico was really, it was both hard and formative. You know, it was like, okay, you gotta get a job so you can rent a place to live. And I made these great, great friends uh, that I had met like working ever so briefly at a movie theater before I got into coffee. And we all started living together. And so I, I did, I formed these like really crazy friendships, but it was one of those overwhelming truths sitting right in front of me. Like this is all that's gonna happen if you stay here. You're just gonna be, you know, going, going out on the weekends, having some drinks, going to work and coffee, hiking around and having like this really fun, chill what I think a lot of people might even consider like a happy life but there was just something below the surface that I just I needed to I needed to experience more I needed to progress more I needed to challenge myself more and it was just too safe of a bet I had a really really um, serious girlfriend that I was just all about and she had gotten a scholarship to um, she was like a few years younger and she was getting a D1 scholarship to go swim in Hawaii and so she was going and it was gonna be like this heartbreaking time and it just so happened to be the similar opportunity where like the world comes together sometimes and you are presented essentially I think with your path forward and a lot of times if you're able to pay attention you'll know when those times come it's just your gut takes over and it's like yes so yeah she was leaving this was about to happen I was like okay cool I'm about to be like extra sad I need to be distracted from that I'm about to stay in this place and if I stay I have this ball that I know exactly what's in this ball or box, you can use box, or I could leave. And if I leave, there's something that I know about myself. I'm good at guest services. I make amazing coffee, even though y'all heard I got last place at the breeze competition. I progressed dramatically the next year before I left for Santa Cruz. And I believe that what I can do and help these people that I, I'm moving with, I believe we could we could change the game for specialty coffee. And I was like, it's time to do something that you believe in for you. And it's also time to get over this girl ASAP. <laughs> so uh, you gotta like leave everything behind and go for it. And I did. I, I moved here to Santa Cruz and it was super gnarly. I got a Craigslist house with like worst place ever. And uh, started that journey. Had no friends, lived in my room. I worked from 5 a.m. till 10 to 11 p.m. every day for three months without a day off to start the company. And yeah, just like, probably would have looked like a psychopath if you were to see me in my room. So I'd like paint the walls to get my creative expression out in this room that was already painted yellow. It just was so rough. Like if you saw that guy in that room, you'd be like, no chance in hell you're talking to him right now. So yeah, that's, that's kind of like the progression there. And were you at that time still, like, as you made that transition from Chico to moving up here, were you still as, like, active as you once were? Or you mm. like yeah. No, that's a great question. It's, yeah, when I, moved, when I moved to Santa Cruz, I was actually far less active. So probably one of the negative things about falling in love with that girl is that I stopped playing basketball and I spent all my time with her. So I actually fell off my, my fitness wagon altogether. And I remember getting here and being like, well, I've always wanted to be a surfer. So I've got that opportunity. And so, yeah, I, I started 
getting in shape by surfing, which let me just tell you, that's not a thing, because half of surfing is just sitting there. Uh, I am very impatient, so I couldn't sit there. I did get in some shape. I would paddle nonstop. I'd be like, cool, it's not coming here. I'm going to paddle over there and paddle over there and paddle over there. But no, my fitness basically pretty much altogether stopped with the exception of surfing until I started feeling like I was like gaining weight in a weird way. And, uh, and then I started kind of running a little bit. But no, my fitness, it fell off. And I tried to take up basketball in this town. This is not a, it is now we have the Warriors, the G League Warriors, but this town is not a basketball town by default at all. So I'd go to play and man, if you came from a place that had fundamental basketball and like strategy and thoughts and you go play street ball where everybody stands in the key and just bonks into each other and doesn't play, it's just disheartening. So I just, I kind of gave up and I was for sure for a while there, pretty like just a surfer, kind of feeling out of my element, trying to make it in this new place that was really hard, all while believing that we were going to build something big through this coffee thing. Yeah, so I was fat and hag. <laughs> not really, not really. Oh, for sure, I was out of shape. That was a beat scene, dude. I was just, yeah, I was there. And I did, I, through coffee, though, I met um, Pat Barber, who, if you're in CrossFit, you've mostly heard his name. And he and I connected because he's a really social dude. He liked coffee, and he's interested as well. So he, he would ask me questions about coffee. I'd serve him coffee, and he'd tell me about CrossFit and his wife, Taz, who had, was like the first person to open CrossFit in New Zealand. She opened CrossFit in New Zealand, ended up selling it. But like, he would talk about CrossFit, and I'd be like, oh, cool, dude, a lot of weightlifting, which... If you grew up in, in my era, people who are super jocks, you know, they sit there and they bench press and they just like, you know, curl and the attitude of the people, the stereotype of those kind of people when I was growing up or the people that I was like, no, 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 no. Like I have, I have thoughts. I don't want to be associated with those people who just only look at their bodies and are super vain and have no care. So I had this like notion that CrossFit was for people who just <laughs> wanted to get strong and didn't really have a goal, and, and I was obviously wrong, and it took him probably seven years, and some support to get me into CrossFit, <laughs> to give it a try. And what was the, like, like, was there any sort of, like, catalyst in that, in that, like, in those later years, that would have, like, prompted you to, like, okay, like, I'm willing to get into CrossFit, what was the, what was the game changer that got me to try it? Yeah, so... The, a lot of the CrossFit dudes that are my friends, and they're actually at a bunch of different boxes. It's not all at my box at CrossFit Up, but we were, there's this men's getaway for like a weekend where we go surf and everything. And then I got invited to one. Um, the owner of my gym, Ryan DeWitt, he's also a physical therapist, so he's really intense about, you know, movement and physio. And we were uh, at that trip, and everybody was in crazy shape, and I was like, you guys are looking pretty tight. You guys are looking like for real, and I'm for sure not. I was like, I'm better surfers than a lot of y'all, but like, who cares about surfing? And, and they were really awesome, though. They had this camaraderie. They were friends, and it was, it was a really good weekend. I was like, oh, these are, these are people that I could actually have community with myself. And that is something, like I said, when I moved to Santa Cruz, I never really picked it up, and the coffee community is not necessarily a place I found myself connected. It's a place I've been able to thrive, but I've never been... I've never been like a, I've been a part of it, but, but more of like doing my own thing as my business partner, Chris and I, and Charles, we just, we've always kind of had our own approach. So we never were fully immersed in it. And so I never felt connection there. And these dudes where I was like, we get on well, and you know, just come do CrossFit with us. And I was like, I'm not going to do CrossFit. It's just a bunch of weightlifting. Like I, I'm going to suck. I used to be a good athlete. I'm going to come in. I'm going to be the worst person there. I'm going to feel bad about myself the whole time. And they're like, how about this? we're buying you a month of CrossFit and then you can never come again, but I, you have to commit to three days a week. How about that? Will you come? I promise you it's different, but will you come if we do that? And, and it is a, it's a money commitment. And I was pretty poor starting this place. We gave everything, which is like a whole other story. I was homeless, the whole thing to start this business. And we can talk about that later. So yeah, they, they got me to come first day. I guess I did a fundamental six fundamentals classes. Two or three of which I was like, am I going to pass out? I like, got myself so psyched out, psyched up that I thought I was going to pass out. And the coach Eddie was like, no, nobody's ever passed out. Like, you're going to be fine. 
Uh, and then my first real workout was like a death by burpee and, and power clean workout, you know, and for anybody who doesn't know what that is, that's, you know, you do one and one for the first minute, then two and two until you can't do it anymore. And I remember do, trying with 85 pounds, no, no, you know, progression whatsoever and getting through six rounds and dying and, but, and being the worst in the class, again, so worst at barista competition, then worst in the class, but the difference was I left that class not feeling like a loser at all. I actually felt pretty encouraged. Everybody was like, so sick to have you. That was awesome. Like first, first, first try. That's actually better than a lot of people in their first try, and it's kind of giving you a little bit of that love back. And it was, it was encouraging. It was the first time in a long time that I felt like anybody felt like investing in just encouraging me in a honest way and a genuine way. And it wasn't just like that cheesy coach vibe where you're like, you know. Yeah. So that was tight. That was cool. There was no blowing smoke. It was like straight real, you know, like you've got a lot of improvement to do and a lot of your technical movements, which you will forever have, by the way, and don't compare your beginning to everybody else's middle. Like everybody's been here already for a while. They've been working on this stuff and where you're at is surprisingly good. And the next time we did a workout, it happened to be the mile run. And in my class, I got the second fastest time. They're like, dude, see, you're good at stuff too. And it was just like this whole like, show up keep showing up you're doing you're doing well and that meant a lot for me in a town where you feel alone and you feel yeah isolated to feel like you're a part of a tribe which everybody wants to be it was tight to feel accepted like right of right away and it was so many different people which i also love and i was like oh you go here i've seen you i've made you coffee and you and oh you own cat and cloud oh sick this is rad i'm gonna try it there's this whole thing that happened like one weekend i was like oh i'm gonna I think I'm gonna stay. So it was kind of a quick jump off, and then I had to obviously eat my humble pie and tell all my bros, you guys were right. <laughs> it's pretty sick. <laughs> and then sorry to all my staff who I has to and has had to hear me talk about CrossFit ever since, because I do. Yeah. Uh, so taking it, I guess, taking it back a bit, uh, just with the process of starting Yeah. Starting Verve, yeah. Yeah, Starting Verve, uh, it was a really, I had this unique perspective. It was probably like young naivety, but, or just like, it was naivety for sure. But I, I knew we were going to be not only successful, but big. And there was never a doubt. And I think there was like some honest intuition there too, because I think a lot of people when they're young can be naive to say like, everything's gonna work out perfect, which is different than how I felt. I was just like, I know that we're offering something that I haven't seen right now. And I've, I've gone to this like global coffee stuff. It's, it's different, like we're doing something different. And so I had this, this just full dedication to we're going to serve the best coffee. We're going to give service in an industry that's pretty shitty at service. And we're going to do something that matters. And not only that, like, I personally am going to gather so many quality ballers and convince them to come work with us that we're going to have, like, the best powerhouse company ever and we're going to be the best company on the planet. And I really thought that. And I actually still believe we had the trajectory to be that for the good first five years, six years maybe of it. Uh, and so... Yeah, a lot of hard work, a lot of learning. Uh, the hardest part, though, is that I feel like it wasn't development and coaching. So one of the things that I've loved about CrossFit is getting coached, getting taught, getting pushed, getting given wisdom and information about a, a process or an opportunity to move forward. And then in that place, I was it was it was a different style. The style was more like you've only done this wrong, you've only done this wrong, here's what we've done wrong. And I think that's a pretty, a pretty normal leadership style for most companies, but I was, it was not one that I think is the best, and it's not how we do things here. And so, yeah, I felt like I was, I was left to my own devices and often felt more so like I was never good enough versus how do I succeed. And there was this interesting juxtaposition there with that that would happen forever. And so the growth came from a lot of hard-learned lessons, of going from this dude who never 25 hour work week into a dude who worked 
80, 90 hours a week without a day off for three to five months, doing something you believed in and being successful in it, but just getting your ass handed to you every single day. If it's not one thing, it's another. And that was a big part of it. Was there any part, any time where you were just like, all right, I'm ready to pack this all up? Like, yeah, baby. Like, Check out this sick foreshadowing. <laughs> it was, oh gosh, we hired our first hire outside of the four of us who started the company, or our first big hire who was gonna step right into leadership. Shitty hire, worst hire ever. I voiced it from the beginning, and this person was in charge of wholesale. Interesting thing they did do, booked us a event at the CrossFit Games in Aromas in 2009. I had a migraine. I hated the guy at the time who I was doing this event with. And we had to drive out in the U-Haul in the 100 plus degree weather and serve our coffee to hot coffee to people who didn't want hot coffee. <laughs> and I was like, I'm sitting here, and this is before I knew what CrossFit was at all, so this is actually funny too. Thanks for bringing that up. So I'm sitting there with a migraine, having the worst day of my life, two and a half months into the three months without a day off working as early as I f literally wake up at five, finish at 10, 11 at night. And I'm like, fuck this, dude. I'm gonna become a firefighter because at least I can get three days off if I become a firefighter. At least I can know that I'm gonna bank on that and I'm, I, can, I can become a firefighter because I also have this belief that I can do whatever I set my mind to, which is not what I mean. I believe I can do whatever I wanna do if I need to do it. I believe in myself like that. It's not like a reach for the stars thing. So yeah, we were there and I, ditched him at the cart and sat in the U-Haul with the air conditioning on and like literally like broke down and I was like, I can't do this. And yeah, that was, that was the moment where I was like, nah. And I don't know why I didn't I give up, probably because I have a lot of determination to see things through that I commit to. So yeah, I went home and I went to sleep. Then I woke up and actually my friend, who's now my business owner, Chris, and a bunch of people had come to town and they were actually watching the CrossFit Games and they were into weightlifting at the time. So they're like, these guys are really strong. They're going nuts out there. And I didn't know even anything about it, but we all got together later that night and just had dinner and it was a nice night and they were in coffee. And I was like, okay, well, I like these dudes. And they got my back. They came here to see me. They hear me, came here to support this company. I'm gonna get a couple of them to work with me. <laughs> And that's going to help me feel not so I isolated and on an island. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep at this because it's brand new. And if I leave to go back, to, it's, I'm not going back yet. So I'm going to see this through for a while. And then if I need to become a firefighter, I will. But we're too early in. We're, we're not three months in yet. So that, that was the worst. And then, yeah, it happened again uh, when the company decided to make some big turns. Seven years in, I was head of retail. And... It was just, I was not aligned with what they were doing anymore, so it was time to go. And at that point, it was time to go, so it was time to go. I would have become toxic if I stayed. And how long after that uh, transition out did you guys end up starting? So I left, yeah, I left Verve Coffee 2014. We officially started Cat and Cloud pre our brick and mortar here in 2015, late. What happened was um, I went to Santa Barbara to help Dune Coffee, who were just awesome, kind of get settled in their development. Got to flex my wings, got to learn a lot both sides. Just did a cool podcast on that. But I was there, and they all n always knew I was going to do my own thing. Through a, a whole other story, my current business partner had gone through his a super fail for himself in, in life and business. And reached out for some help, and we just decided it was time to start really pushing for it. So. Charles and Chris, Charles, Jack, and Chris Baca, they're my business partners. Charles was an analyst at actually Verve Coffee, and he similarly was just having a hard time with the values. And we all just started talking, talking about what we believed in, and we really believed we could do something different, bigger, more holistic, more values driven, more just soul moving. And so we decided to, yeah, take the leap and just like put it all together. And, and the Dune was really awesome. And, the French Press is also their, their company. There are two companies down there. They supported us well. They let us launch our podcast, launch a subscription service to coffee so that we could pre-prove that we could 
sell coffee to the world so that we could get our SBA loan, so that we could get this building. The rest is kind of history there. But we got this building in one week once I called somebody to ask for it. And the whole nine, it's, it was crazy. Yeah, big learning experience. So about a year and a half between leaving Verve and officially starting this place. And with, uh, in terms of like, I guess during this period, in terms of, I guess, inspiration, was there anything that kind of like stuck out or like, just like, yeah, just popped up and just like, hey, this is it, like, this is it. This is it. Yeah, there was, so the inspiration around how powerful I believe our company could be specifically wasn't there at the time. I was still moving from a place where it was like about coffee into the way you do business. So what I knew was that we could do a values-based business where we were transparent and we could give back. And I thought that that was a huge step forward for business. But I also knew we could do amazing coffee, roast amazing, co amazing coffee, and, and express it. And we did have some momentum in that Chris and myself had both placed in the top five in the United States barista competitions and also had done really well prior. So in 2012, I had won a regional and we both placed in the top in the national finals, which only one person goes on to world. So that's really good in the coffee stage. And then the next year, 2013, we were both on the front page of Barista Magazine talking about how we were able to have a career without starting our own business, which is totally ironic. At the time, we totally believed that. So really, early on, I was like, we're going to have an actual vision, we're going to have an actual mission that we live by, and we're going to have a values-based business so that we can grow as big as we want to grow and still retain who we are, and, and we're going to really dive into learning about that. And so there was a lot of motivation there, and that came from actually Disney. Uh, Walt Disney was a big uh, believer in that stuff. He was polarizing, but like he was the guy who stuck to what he believed in, and this is how we do, do it, and if you're in, you're in, and you get it, and if you don't, no hard feelings, but like see out there. So that was kind of how that started. And it was, it became a lot more, a lot bigger, a lot more deep as we opened Cat and Cloud and started really learning more about ourselves, swimming on our own, figuring things out on our own without having to go, go with whatever anybody else believed in. We get, to, we get to go with what we believe in is the best idea. And so there was, that was how that worked. And there's a lot more to, our progression, but yeah, that was essentially Walt Disney for me was a big one. Chris is really influenced by skateboard companies, but that was a lot of having to do with authenticity was a real huge key to both of our approaches. And then being able to speak to something in a way where you could actually see it integrate in all areas of your company and don't you dare just fucking say bullshit buzzwords to everybody that sound good to make yourself look good if you're not gonna be about them. And that was the difference between where we had come from in our lives, every single place we had been, with so many cool words that sound sick, that don't mean a damn thing when the rubber meets the road, to like, we're not gonna be that. And so I guess those were, that was like my sum up of where our inspiration came from, is we're gonna be what we say we're gonna be in every way, and we're gonna make sure that that is clear. So in some sense, it's almost like making sure and ensuring that the community can trust you. Yes. Yeah, it's it is. It's like if you're gonna engage in your com community, if you're gonna do anything that's worthwhile, like it has to be about we, not about me. And we both, and Charles as well. I'm talking Chris and I specifically so much because we came from the barista background. But we, all three of us, without a doubt, we're like we can have the best ideas in the world. We can give you a step by step way to get there, give ourselves a step by step, and it will never happen without surrounding yourself with the right people to accomplish these goals. Like, so who gives a shit? Like, you, if you, you could change the world, you could cure cancer, but if you don't have the steps in front of you to do it, like, you're gonna have to find somebody to help you, even if you got the brain for it. So we were like, yeah, how can we bring people along with us who wanna stay with us, who wanna have careers, who wanna develop themselves to be the best they can be? and understand that we're gonna be imperfect in doing it, but we're sure as hell gonna do it, and we're sure as hell gonna 
practice and yeah, progress and challenge ourselves to be able to go there so that others can go there with us. And if we're gonna be those kind of leaders, maybe we're worth following. And then maybe somebody else can come do that too, you know? And I'm so about that, I still believe that. Like, coffee is our catalyst for change, we've always said that. We know it, we're amazing at it. We're not a coffee company. Our mission is to leave people happier than we found them and we're, we're, gonna, be, we're gonna be a company that helps change the way people do business. What do, you, what do you do now here within uh, Cat and Cloud and like what is like your day to day like and like what yeah. is like, like your main focus right now? Cool. Yeah, my day, my day to day at Cat and Cloud has changed a lot. We, you know, going from founding this, the two stores we have now, we're working on two more stores, one of which is a, a concept that's kind of a hybrid with a, a breakfast restaurant and cafe. So that's, that's our fourth cafe we're going to open. And what that's, uh, it's created the necessary, the necessity actually for me to grow and to step away from being just an operator to more of a developer, a critical thinker and a leader. And that's been really challenging, but really cool. And what I mean by that is, you know, I have my, my right and left hands and Kristen and Tanner and specifically, I'm in charge of, of retail and that's the majority of our people right now. And so what it's forced me to do is to look at reality, look at what it takes to develop somebody to take your place and be better than you are at what you have done in the past. And there's so much that goes into that that it can be challenging and overwhelming for some. I kind of love it. I have the right people around me to have crazy in-depth conversations and we, we you know we're always doing things we're reading, we're developing like nobody's going to teach you unless you teach yourself and I don't want that to be the case for somebody else. That's what happened to me. So a lot of my life right now is, is fully strategic planning of succession planning and what are we going to do after these four stores and how can we provide opportunities for that belief to be true. We can do whatever we want. How can we educate more people and other businesses to feel like they can step into any arena, not just coffee, and make an impact with a mission. Part of it has been helping people to recognize that leaving people happier than you find them does not mean you create a utopian society. It does not mean that it's always yes and it's always stars and rainbows. It sometimes, maybe more often than not, means here's some hard feedback. Here's some hard coaching. Here's some things that are going to create friction in you and in your life. But they're the kind of things that bear the kind of fruit that make you into the next best version of yourself. And that's something that I have to take myself through a lot of the time or else I fail everybody who works with me. I want to help that become our culture here because if you are the kind of culture that steps into true leadership, true feedback, true coaching, true development, then you change people's lives. And that means that like they don't have to stay here. They could have actually gone to the school of Cat and Cloud and left the best team member wherever they go ever in their life. And that is a win as well. So it's, it's transitioned a lot from, you know, I make coffee once, twice a month, which I, and I make it every day for myself, but I make it for people once, twice a month. And the rest of the time it's specific development meetings with Kristen, my team leader, and, or not team leader, my uh, skills development leader, and Tanner, my cultural development leader. And then together with them working to develop the team leaders for each store and the coordinators and these people who are certified to lead and just working on kind of bookending that where you know how it starts and the training that you can put together you know where you want to go and then how can you get that to sink so so deeply through osmosis and teaching that two years from now somebody who i know but don't work specifically with is going to teach better than i taught when we first opened in every single way. And that that understanding of why we are doing what we do is so deep that people recognize that their own little brand of magic and their own little thing that makes them them is totally worth investing in even from intro level at Cat and Cloud because that's what makes it special here. And that that's not only going to be stuck there, it can go other places too. So that's, that's a snapshot into my complicated brain right now. That's where we're at. We're figuring that out. We're figuring out what happens after four stores. 
and how to let the people who want to open coffee shops open coffee shops and how to let the people who want to do some crazy stuff maybe open CrossFit gyms, open CrossFit gyms, whatever. And that's literally what I mean, whatever, because we can do whatever we want. So it's like, it's more than just like, because like you, you see some people or some businesses and they're so focused on like, oh, like what's your competitive advantage or like what's like, how can we beat so-and-so? And it's like, it's a little bit more than that in that regard. So it's just like, no, like let's elevate people. And then from there, like, it's, it's almost like it's not about you anymore. It's just about like making, like you said, like leaving people better. Yeah. A rising tide lifts all boats. Yeah. And so it's like, it's, it's, I see how like, there's a lot of parallels with CrossFit, right? Like, as, you know, as a coach, you want to uh, develop your athletes and mm-hmm. get them to a point to where they become autonomous. Mm-hmm. They can go anywhere they want. They can live fit, more fit lives. Uh, and they can, can teach other people as well. And just like improve their, their world around them. And so like, I guess, like what sort of, like other lessons or like what sort of parallels do you find that crossover between mm-hmm. you know being more of like an architect with Pat Cloud as well as being like a CrossFit Yeah. Yeah, CrossFit CrossFit is amazing to me because it teaches you capacity. And most of the time it actually fucks up your view for the better of your own capacity and I love that so like yeah you have development and you have coaches and you have people who are feeding into you but you also have this element of confidence that will come from knowing that oh I felt shittier than I've ever felt in my life doing this exercise and I was okay and I felt more uncomfortable at times and more incapable at times and I stuck with it and all of a sudden I can do a ring muscle up now. You know, like these things that come, there's these lessons that are true in life that actually kind of the the bridge gets built for you there and you don't realize it's happening. You know, you step in and they're like one day at a time. You're just doing this thing and you don't even think about it for those who don't get on their sugar wads and look ahead to like the exercise, they just show up. Like, oh damn, I'm doing handstand walking today or something that I've never, I for sure can't do. And they're like, well, I can't handstand walk. Um, And it's like, yeah, that's cool. Well, you can do this or this or this scaled version of it. And all of a sudden, again, flash forward a year of just like, oh, all of a sudden you can do kipping handstand push-ups. And that is a really powerful thing that people should sit back and look at when you do CrossFit, when you do things, anything hard that you stick with. It's like, where was I and where am I now? What did it feel like? And what am I capable now because of all these things I I went through that didn't feel good at all? Like, the things that feel good in CrossFit on the real are when you're done and you give the dabs to everybody who struggled with you. And then when you get addicted to it, it's the excitement of like, oh, I'm about to do something that is going to be so hard. And then I just did 200 pull-ups today and 300 air squats and I ran two miles and I did all this work in this short period of time. And then you can sit back and you're like, can, can you believe, Jared, that you did that? And then people outside of that who don't, who don't know, who don't experience, who don't believe in themselves or haven't been able to be in a place where you get shown to believe in yourself, they go like, you did what? how much did you, did you, you did, why? And it's like, it actually isn't a why, it was just part of the day. <laughs> you know, like it was fun, it was hard. I did it to improve. And it was challenging. Like, why challenge yourself like that? I'm like, Because I'm learning every single day that if I do challenge myself like that, I can do things that are really valuable and everybody else can do those things too. So I, 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 there's so many parallels for me in CrossFit. There's the, there's the self-discipline, there's the drive, there's, there's the community coming together to support somebody like in the open or whenever where you're just like, they're so happy for you that you accomplished a thing. And to just have in a world where everybody's really more dog eat dog and you know, anti the rising tide lifts all boats, who is your competition? How do you take out your competition? I'm like, well, how about no? How about 
everybody can get to whatever level they strive to get to. I don't expect everybody to be on the same level as myself or somebody like whatever, Jay-Z, like my favorite person in the world. Like they get there for their own motivations, but I want people to at least, at least know that they can believe in themselves enough to strive for some of that stuff instead of not trying, you know? First best, do the right thing. Second best, do the wrong thing. Worst thing, don't do anything. <laughs> You know, and that's like not my quote. That's like uh, Theodore Roosevelt or somebody like that. But it's like most people do nothing. So I'm like, CrossFit is at least to do something. Yeah. You know, my wife goes now. Yeah, start three days a week. Now I'm a five day a week guy, and and I like it and it's helpful for mental health, physical health, literally healing diseases. Don't get sick as much. And those are all things that people are like, I want that. I want that. I'm like, cool. What are you gonna do about it? It does, and everything takes work. And so the biggest value in CrossFit is you can get through being far more uncomfortable than you think you can get through. There are things you can get through. I didn't even say that right. That was weird. I got distracted. And <laughs> you are more capable than you might realize if you just take the steps to become what you could be. And coaches help you see that sometimes. We have a great coach, Sarah. She makes me do way harder work than I start out thinking I'm gonna do. And then I do it and she's like, hey, did you know that you were the top of the class today? And I'm like, not the top of the class guy. She's like, you, you did the fastest time and the most work today. And I'm like, what? So yeah, well, cool, thanks. <laughs> I would never would have done that weight if you didn't make me do that weight. Yeah, that's, that's so, like, that's really cool. Like, that's another thing that, like, I mean, I've only done one too just kind of seeing how it was just like the economy, it was like the, uh, uh, just like helping people, and how helping people grow and to get into, um, you know, opening up an affiliate and mm -hmm. all these other things, and then ultimately working for CrossFit and then helping even more people. Yeah. And then it's like, you know, from the athlete level as well, it's like, if you go through this experience, then you can go and communicate that same experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Having the attitude too of like understanding that it's worth it and just just like the positive attitude does take you to the place where you can help others. You know, it's like Tommy's got a it, it seems like a really great attitude and really positive outlook and it's encouraging for people and they're like, oh, well, if he feels that, maybe I can feel that way. And it's like, you can, <laughs> you know. And it's like, yeah you be, end up becoming like an, kind of an evangelist for the things you believe in. But when it is not about just me, I mean, I'm like, cool, I don't, I don't get anything if you show up or don't. I get nothing. But I think you could, yeah. you know? And that's a lot of the time I think people don't realize is that when people in the world offer thoughts and advice, so oftentimes I think they, they will think that you're saying it because you see a deficiency or you see a, a weakness. And, if you take a step back and flip the script, maybe you're just like seeing somebody who's felt what it's like to get to a level you never expected yourself get to, and to be like, whoa, I think everybody should experience how cool this could be. And that's something, yeah, that's something that if you're considering CrossFit and you think it's this total weird cult, it's only a cult because it's so fun. <laughs> Nobody's actually drinking real Kool-Aid. It's all fit aid. They stay away from sugar. It's all good. And if it was Kool-Aid without sugar, it tastes gross anyway. So you know what I'm saying? We are the good times. All right. We, 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 we. Okay. Books, things, podcasts. Shit, man. You are opening a gauntlet of where do I even start? Okay. So for people who want to maybe learn about how to teach well in like a really fun, easy way. There's a book called Move Your Bus by Ron Clark. And that's kind of, it's a book that has to do with an approach to leading and teaching. This dude was an inner city teacher in Detroit who ended up just having, a, through his perspectives, growing this huge company where people come all around the world to learn how to teach. It's also still a school. Move Your Bus is great. Um, the Coaching Habit, which is not at all what you'd think if you're a CrossFit coach sort of person, but it's a really applicable one. The Coaching Habit by Michael Bungay Stainer and his company Box of Crayons is just hot fire. It is one of those books that you can 
learn to communicate with different groups of people and different people by just asking questions, being more curious, stop telling people what to do and how to do it, and more learning about them. It's great for relationship building, but also helping people to, to kind of self-guide to their best selves as well as to their own problem solving and, and recognizing what actually the problems are that hold them up. That one's really crazy key. Anything from Simon Sinek, which I'm reading right now, he's got a lot of connecting points into learning about whys and your motivations, which is rad. People hate the Enneagram for the same reason they hate CrossFit, but if you actually take the time and learn about Enneagram, it's a personality assessment situation, you can start learning about your motivations and how other people view the world so you can start understanding people. I'm just gonna keep listening for a second, you can just go and cut. But uh, I'm, I'm pretty into that as well. Um, I mean, podcasts, you know, there's Coaching for Leaders. That's a great podcast. There's a fun podcast that if you have to do with marketing called Story Brand by Donald Miller, and they have a really comprehensive look at some things. Uh, and I could probably go on and on and on. How to Be a Boss is a really simple, straightforward leadership book with all application that you could just like get into, read in two days tops and like apply. But I'm getting, I'm just non-stop learning. Oh, and then for everybody, just do it, especially for those assertions and like stepping into a different place. Unfuck yourself. It's actually un beep. Like it doesn't spell it all out. Book is sick. And if you do audio books, which I do, I do both and. Download the app Hoopla. This is a free plug because I don't get paid for it. And get a library card because your library card will allow you to download any audiobook on Hoopla for free up to like eight rentals a month and all you have to do is have an, a library card and anything that's in your county will be available and so you can get yourself some free learning. There's no fucking excuse for you to not get better at something and Unfuck Yourself is very great. It's a very, very good book about just like, it's about assertions, it's about knowing how your brain works, it's about knowing how you get in the way of yourself. And the crazy truth in there is that 95% of your day is run by subconscious thoughts. 95% of your day is run by unconscious thoughts. You can change that. So if you want to feel like it's okay for 95% of your life to be on autopilot, stay the same. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, you know, I've been hearing more about that myself as well. This guy, Sam Hogan. Mm -hmm. There is another one on this list of mine. I have this huge list that I'm like, how am I going to get through this? But yes. Yeah, he, uh, he was talking about that. Uh, like, just also kind of taking it from there, like, uh, working on the like, uh, death from a thousand cuts. Mm -hmm. There's, like, so many different things that are, like, distracting us from our phones and all these, you know, all these different things, that, all these different stimuli. Yeah. So it's hard for us to, like, you know, make decisions. So we need to start removing from that. No doubt. Contemplation time. Take that time alone, dude. You gotta sit alone, and you just gotta like be with your thoughts, and you gotta write them down. You know, I got I got this journal, multiple books. It's like I would have never thought I would be this person, but at the same time, if I'm not this person, minimum 37 people are fucked. <laughs> Oh, they're not fucked. They have their own lives. They're all smart and amazing. But you know, like, I don't deliver on what I believe I can offer if I don't. And in the same way, you're not for yourself either if you don't do your own version of that every day. And so, yeah, sometimes that's CrossFit. Sometimes that's reading and being quiet. Sometimes that's listening to podcasts. It's probably a combination of all of them. A lot of times it's getting good rest. A lot of times it's having a community to connect with, having some people to get real with, and like working on emotional intelligence, which is on my list as well. There's books on emotional intelligence that are like game changers. It's all worth it, and it's our, our life to make, to make. And like, yeah, people who are here, I believe we're gonna make something epic and unique and different and fun and life-giving, and it's gonna take work, which as it turns out, will be hard. <laughs> So, without the hard work, nothing else happens. So, uh, last question. Oh, baby. Uh, is, uh, we got two options. Kill clip or fitness after workout. Well, 
Fit Aid's my local company. I choose Fit Aid 100% 50-50. Here's the truth, though. I've only had one Kill Cliff, and Fit Aid's everywhere here in town. So, y'all want to sponsor? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm fitted for the local boys, but so far you're with two Santa Cruzians, so yeah. what, what, did, what did Tommy say? Did he say Kill Cliff or uh, fitted? Mm, uh, that's probably what a good businessman would do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's definitely neutral. He, uh, but leaning a little bit more towards Kill Cliff. Okay. Like, oh, okay. But yeah, like, I don't know. It's fitted everywhere. Like, Is it? Yeah. Store. Fit Aid, get it together because the green flavor is your best flavor and it's Golf Aid or whatever they're changing it to now. Like your, your best tasting Fit Aid is your lamest branded Fit Aid. So if you want real talk, there it is. Switch it and reverse it. Get your Missy Elliott on, please. Come on. All right, cool. Well, uh, thank you for hopping on the interview. Woo! Yeah, any last words or anything like that? No, that was a great QOD for the, before my WOD. <laughs> We'll go exercise. <laughs> uh, last words. No, you, you, you heard it here first. I mean, if you feel like you want to check us out, catandcloud.com. I'm sure he's already going to tell you about it. And it's been awesome, David. Thank you. Yeah, sweet. For sure. Sick.